Uh, hi guys, uh, uh, we are, uh, so this is going to be a quite challenging session for me because you know I think the next uh, break is uh, lunch, uh, hopefully uh, all of you can you know withstand hunger yeah, you know until uh, 1.15 uh, till the scheduled uh, end of the session. Um, today we are going to talk about you know how, uh, how we have uh, uh, helped to boost our engineering productivity uh, by building a reliable test infrastructure. Uh, unlike uh, uh, the previous session where there was a commercial break in between, we do the commercial break uh, in the beginning uh, just to introduce us. Uh, my name is Arun. Uh, I lead the quality and release engineering uh, at Mintra and uh, my uh, colleague Sriyari uh, who is a lead engineer uh, as part of release engineering. Right? So what do we do uh, uh, in uh, quality and release engineering? We actually uh, build quality and uh, productivity platforms tools. Uh, to help us deliver faster with better quality. So that's, that's what we are, we focus on, um, you know, in this team, right. Um, I, 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 how many of you shop at Mintra? Just quick raise of hand. So I, I think for those who don't shop, uh, maybe uh, you can have a look at what Mintra is all about. Um, we do have about 2000 uh, um, odd Indian and international brands with about uh, 700k catalog items, 25 million uh, monthly active users. We do about uh, 250k shipments a day. Uh, we are helping uh, to make this world uh, stylish, colorful and uh, happier uh, by use of technology. So that's, that's what, what we do at Mintra, okay. Um, so what, what do we cover here uh, in the next 45 minutes? Uh, we'll talk about, you know, why, uh, what triggered the need for us to create this uh, reliable test infrastructure. Uh, we'll touch a little bit upon, um, you know, uh, Dawkins, that is our internal platform, uh, which is our test infrastructure platform, how it evolved, a demo, a quick demo of the platform and how we integrated, uh, you know, with the continuous integration and deployment, right. So before I get started, uh, a quick raise of hand on, uh, do you guys use test infrastructure, you know, uh, do you have test infrastructure, multiple of them? one of them or do you have single centralized centralized test infrastructure anyone right okay so uh, what uh, how it all started is um, you know as um, as mintra started evolving um, over the last uh, uh, 5 to 7 years uh, the stack complexity also started increasing quite a bit so this is actually a live view of our uh, production uh, microservices that uh, actually runs it it doesn't fit into the screen but that's the that's the mesh that we have created. Uh, we have tried to break down a lot of monoliths into microservices. Still, there is a number of uh, uh, components out there which are still being run as monoliths. So as the, as the stack increase, uh, increases, it, uh, it became harder for us to, uh, you know, start maintaining reliable test infrastructures for us to kind of like do integration tests, run automated tests, uh, you know, from, uh, from an integration uh, performance. Uh, security, end-to-end uh, -end, uh, systems, uh, system end-to-end -end tests, uh, you know, all of these th things started becoming a great uh, uh, challenge because uh, more developers you have, the more complexity, the more uh, code starts to get pushed in, you know, uh, and it's the same platform that gets used and the test infrastructure started, uh, uh, you know, deteriorating. So what it led to is uh, we had a lot of unstable uh, test environments that is going around. Uh, primarily because of, um, uh, you know, the bad code quality that comes, uh, you know, few techniques maybe from the last talk on how uh, we should improve code quality. Uh, debugging environmental issues of these 500 services also started becoming a nightmare, uh, you know, uh, um, and, uh, you know, environment issues were derailing a lot of our, uh, you know, projects from uh, reaching our consumers, right. So, as a result of, uh, uh, unstable test infrastructure, our ability to certify with confidence um, also started deteriorating because the automated test starts failing uh, because, because it is being run on a brittle, volatile environment, constant data changes, config changes and uh, all of these things uh, led to uh, even not being able to certify with confidence. And this, uh, uh, this amounted to loss of engineers productivity. Uh, because engineers spend most of the time uh, debugging their environment issues, uh, you know, maybe uh, 
the dependent team, uh, there, are, there are few things that gets changed, uh, you know, from the dependence, dependency and, uh, you know, due to which, uh, you know, you are stuck kind of like, uh, because you are not able to proceed for uh, your integration tests and, you know, other stuff. The other uh, challenge that we also had is uh, we, we were unable to work uh, or push features in parallel uh, because uh, there were, you know, few uh, centralized infrastructures where people used to push code on and, uh, you know, it was, it was getting blocked uh, and pipelined with the amount of changes that, are, uh, that were needed to uh, get across. So, uh, uh, frequent downtime, you know, and a lot of these things uh, technically, you know, the more time that you take to uh, release stuff to uh, production, you are, you not only get frustrated, but, but also uh, it, uh, it leads to, uh, uh, you know, eating into your engineering team's uh, productivity, frustrations, all that started increasing, right? So, uh, finally, we thought that maybe uh, we started off thinking of, uh, you know, why don't we put all these 500 services and, uh, you know, give as a Mintra in a box to any, any, anyone, you know, who would want to create an infrastructure on their own. But, um, uh, you know, the sad part is uh, it's, it sounded good, but, um, you know, I think it also comes with a lot of infrastructure costs. Just to give you some perspective, to put all of these 500 services uh, in VMs and give it as a single, um, uh, you know, Mintra in a box kind of environment, it, it minimum takes about uh, 20 high-end uh, uh, Azure machines. And imagine if you need all of your engineering uh, population to have this, uh, it, it, it is just going to, you know, blow uh, everything out of proportion. So, uh, we were thinking quite a bit about this and then, uh, you know, finally, uh, uh, we, uh, we came to a conclusion that, uh, you know, running on VMs uh, doesn't scale anymore for us and uh, we need to start shipping all these services as, as containers, so, uh, uh, and, uh, you know, that was the thinking of, uh, you know, uh, that we needed to move into the container way, right? So, this was uh, the thought process uh, uh, behind this. Uh, a, we wanted to containerize all services. Uh, we wanted to have a reference uh, infrastructure which is equivalent to, uh, you know, production, uh, uh, which we call internally a stage. And uh, we, uh, we wanted all, in, anyone in the engineering org, uh, to be able to, um, you know, create a subset of environment and uh, uh, practically um, fall back to any other dependencies that you need uh, back on stage. So, uh, we wanted to create uh, ephemeral environments which gets destroyed, you know, uh, as soon as the uh, testing, uh, or your dev test or, uh, you know, uh, quality tests are done on these uh, environments. And Nobody should be uh, dependent on knowing, you know, how to deploy these services, right? Everything needs to, um, you know, uh, come by its own. And uh, the last but not the least, uh, you know, uh, uh, in case of uh, big bang projects where uh, the compliance norms and many other things keep changing in uh, e-commerce world, um, a lot of components of, a lot of services gets impacted when uh, certain big rollouts happen. Say, for example, uh, when we rolled out GST, uh, uh, a lot of these services had to undergo a change because of the way data gets propagated, right? So, we also needed ability to create, bring up full-fledged environment, uh, both from, uh, you know, test perspective as well as, uh, you know, getting stuff deployed on production in terms of uh, if we have to uh, tackle uh, uh, BCP uh, in an event of disaster, uh, how do we quickly get, uh, you know, uh, the whole infrastructure stack up? So, these were the thought processes of, uh, you know, uh, uh, for us to build this uh, platform uh, uh, that is Dawkins. And uh, uh, I'll have my colleague uh, Srihari to take you through uh, what we do in Dawkins, uh, what's the architecture and, uh, you know, the demo of the platform as such. Right. Thanks, Arun. So, uh, first of all, can anybody guess what the uh, name Dawkins stands for? Exactly. That's exactly what we're doing. We've just, uh, you know, containerized the whole of uh, Jenkins and abstracted that layer. And uh, because nobody does builds better than Jenkins, right? And if you do know of any tool which, you know, does it even more better with so much more, uh, you know, agility, then uh, do let us know. We'll try to do that also. So, this is the architecture of uh, the uh, Dawkins portal. 
it is a little complex uh, uh, to see it out for sure, but probably while we go through the demo, we can come back to uh, this slide and you know, uh, take a look at what are these components, what they do. In a nutshell, there is a, a, a UI layer which we have built in house and uh, there is also a controller which talks to the different other components that we have. We have a, a Rethink DB as our uh, data store. We have Jenkins as you have already uh, guessed, the Docker registry where all our artifacts go and sit. And uh, there are different environments also. There are fixed environments and there are uh, continuously evolving environments. There are you know, short term environments. Some of the uh, fixed environments are the stage environments and the integration environments where stage is like a production look alike while the integration environment is a bleeding edge, a forward looking uh, environment. While your feature tests run in a QA uh, environment which uh, you know uh, is can be recreated in you know a smaller subset does not need to have all your uh, complete set of services, right. So we will actually uh, jump into the demo right now and I will actually show you how uh, a particular QA environment is created, how a developer can actually quickly create an environment for his own tests without any disturbances uh, from any other person. So this is uh, the Dawkins UI that uh, we have built in our uh, and uh, this is a view where you can actually create your different types of uh, clusters. So I am going to actually create a QA cluster with the Mintra website and uh, suppose I am a developer who has got some uh, changes to the API backend for, of Mintra, right. So I give it a name first of all, let me give it a name, Agile 2. And uh, as you see, uh, my email ID comes up and the team that I belong to comes up and I can say, uh, l let's give a TTL for this particular uh, environment for maybe 20 hours. So I just want to uh, run a few tests and automation, manual, whatever you want, right? All of that for 20 hours. And there are a few different configurations you can fall back to. Uh, the fixed environments are uh, the ones that you can actually fall back to. Uh, for now, we have only the stage environment. So like I said, I was going to make a change to the API uh, of the Mintra. So uh, there is a service called the API Gateway, just quickly select it and uh, you can see the different types of configurations for this particular application come up, you know, the build type. So we use a, a Node.js uh, build type, I'm uh, sorry, uh, app type and a Gradle build type and uh, I still want to use the master branch and uh, all the different configurations are how, what is the command to build it, what is the port that you expose it and you also notice something called depends. So API gateway directly depends on one of our HA proxy configurations. So in my cluster, if I add API gateway, this browse HA proxy application also tags along. So this is a way in which developers really need not need to know like what are their basic dependencies and they can just quickly add their own service and ensure that their base dependencies fall through into it, right? So I am going to start with API Gateway and also uh, maybe I will show you the uh, Jabong website also. Uh, it is called Reincarnation. So I add in the Jabong web website also and hit create. So when I hit create, I have been given two options, whether I want to build a new image or just use the stage image, right? For time's sake, you know, I am just going to uh, use the existing uh, stage image and bring it down. So as soon as I create this particular application, this is actually going to start up the logs of your application and it is going to start up by creating a network. And how this is going to uh, pan out, it is going to take a while, so we will quickly go back to the slide and see how uh, things are happening and come back to uh, the demo. So, so this is the QA environment uh, uh, creation stages. The first step, you know, of course, right now I'm using a stage image which uh, does not really build a new image because that would take a, a lot more time. So during your build and package stages, you would build your application, imageify your application, and push the image into uh, the Docker registry. Uh, post that, uh, we use Docker Swarm in our backend. 
So, uh, there, is, there is this concept of uh, network subnets that is being used and a small subnet is, uh, you know, specified for this particular uh, QA environment. And uh, all your services, whichever you select, right now we've selected a couple of services. One is the API gateway and one is the reincarnation service. So both of these services are going to go and reside in this particular subnet. So why we choose a subnet is because it is easy to talk uh, within a subnet and, you know, to, to be able to control uh, that kind of traffic. Beyond the network creation, uh, you would actually uh, create the container. And we're using Docker uh, Swarm services for this purpose. And this will actually create the uh, container from the image and also do a health check, a basic health check on the container to ensure that your container is live and running. Uh, the last stage of any uh, environment creation is the addition of this particular uh, route to the HA proxy. So HA proxy is our ingress uh, controller in this sense. And uh, because of the, uh, because you can't really expose all the uh, different ports, because we've got, we've got around 500 services and you can't really expose uh, 500 plus ports on our COP network. So the HA proxy acts as your uh, ingress router and so every service can be accessed via the basic ports of AT and 443 and depending on their host mapping, we uh, redirect traffic into the appropriate container. So the HA proxy is the last step uh, of updation. Uh, the QA environments are uh, non-fixed environments, like I, like I gave a TTL of 20 hours for that particular uh, environment. But the stage environments or the integration environments are fixed environments. So the only difference is you don't need to create a network. So that's the only difference across uh, your QA environment and the stage environment. So this is how the actual uh, routing happens. So in this example, I have uh, three different clusters. C1, C2, and uh, C3. C1 has uh, two services, A and B. C2 has another two services, C and D. While C3 has B, C, and D with different versions, and all of them residing in the same swarm without any contact with each other in their own subnets. And uh, using the QAHA proxy, uh, people can actually access these services, while the pre-prod HA uh, proxy is the, the fallback of these services onto the stage environment. So let's quickly uh, go back and check if uh, our cluster, yeah. So if you look at the logs of this particular, uh, you will see that this, uh, the service health check for API gateway was done. For reincarnation also the service uh, health checks have been done. And you will also notice the browse HA proxy service has been automatically added. And it has also uh, gone through his uh, fair share of uh, health checks. And beyond that, we are actually waiting on the HA proxy to be uh, reloaded, which probably takes uh, five minutes. Every five, it's, the reload happens every five minutes. Once this is uh, done, you will see that each of these services, API Gateway, Reincarnation, or Browse HA proxy, have their own URLs, right? So the URL is an auto-generated URL, which uh, uh, you know, specifies to which particular uh, service you want to go to. So using the browser chip proxy URL or the reincarnation URL, we should be in a while probably uh, able to see the Mintra website, the base uh, homepage for uh, Mintra website because I'm working on the API gateway side of uh, the Mintra website. And so I, I would see the homepage and of Mintra and uh, the Jabong service. So how it actually works, we'll come to. So uh, uh, if you see, this is another example of a, of a cluster which has uh, two services, A and C. And uh, the service addresses uh, are the ones that I just showed you. Uh, so the cluster name is C1 and the service A would get a URL called c one a.docins.mintra.com. Uh, and the uh, service B would get c one b .com. So Internally, one of the biggest USPs that we've uh, gotten is, is the fact that there are no need for any kind of config changes within a particular uh, a cluster. Because uh, one thing that we noticed in our older stack was the fact that as soon as uh, you had to change these, uh, you know, if you've created a new environment, you had to go in and change the configs, the DNS, and all these configs so that they can actually talk to each other. 
So what we've actually done here is by using uh, Docker Swarm's uh, aliasing technique. C1 hyphen a dot documents dot mintro dot com will have an alias called D7 A dot mintro dot com. So services A and B talk to each other using the internal D7 URLs. While for external access, you would just continue to use C1 hyphen A dot documents dot mintro dot com. So the advantage here is uh, if uh, since we are in the same uh, subnet, and that's the main reason why we have uh, networks and subnets. So since we are in the same uh, subnet, a D7 A URL would actually map to the A service within that particular subnet, while a D7 B URL would map to the B service within that subnet. So in this way, the resolution order of a particular service within uh, a, a particular subnet if, uh, if, if, if uh, one of these services A and B were talking to another service D and it is not there in your, in your cluster, you would fall back to the state. So the first lookup would happen within that particular uh, subnet. If it is not found in that particular subnet, it would then fall back to the stage. So in this way, a developer could just bring in his services into a cluster and just forget about the rest. So he can uh, fall back to a bleeding edge environment like the integration environment because, for example, if there were changes which were uh, going across the whole board and you have a few services which have gone into the integration environment and are, and are ready to go to production and you have a set of services which you want to test with this bleeding edge, so then you would fall back to the integration environment. But if you just had no relation with any of the other services and you know you just wanted to test how your service would act if you just dropped it into production right now you would just fall back to a stage environment. And this way, instead of having the whole stack, and because at the time we started, we, we had like around uh, 80 to 100 services, but then that grew to 500 plus services. To have all of that in one single environment for each of your teams or for each of your developer sets was going to be a, a very costly affair. And using this kind of a clustering uh, logic, having only your services that you need in your cluster, while falling back to another uh, environment for your default dependencies was one way which we uh, saved a lot of money. So uh, let's quickly go back to, yes, so your uh, cluster has uh, successfully completed. So I'm just going to quickly go to the browse HAProxy URL. So developer could actually quickly open it up in his browser. And this is the Mintra website which uh, has just been created and uh, if I wanted to, I could uh, quickly go and change the branch uh, for my API gateway and deploy my own feature branch and uh, redeploy the application also, right? Similarly, there is also a, a reincarnation URL which is the Jabong website. Quickly see if that is also available. Right, so this is the uh, Jabong side. So both these URLs and uh, API hits also can be done uh, by means of which a developer. Now this environment, Agile 2 environment, is my own environment. Nobody else is going to have access to the environment. Nobody, nobody else is going to have uh, any way of modifying anything. So this way, my tests remain my own unless I uh, decide to go ahead and uh, share my class. So if I go and click this button here, it's actually going to share my cluster and you know, uh, my whole team is going to be able to view my cluster, even edit, rebuild my cluster. So in this way, clusters are used for automation uh, test suites also, wherein uh, people uh, uh, you know, quickly have a team cluster with all their services, maybe 10, 15, 20. We've had clusters with uh, 80, 90 services also. All of them together and uh, running automation test uh, uh, on Jenkins. Right. I'm back to the slide. So this is our uh, stack. Uh, we we can obviously uh, uh, you know talk about the stack and uh, whatever uh, has been used uh, in in all of our uh, different layers uh, offline also. And how uh, we've used Docker Swarm and uh, this this project was started probably around around uh, three three and a half years ago. Uh, so that, that's the reason why you don't see Kubernetes uh, uh, on the slides as of now, and you still uh, see Docker Swarm. So uh, obviously this was not a very uh, you know, easy thing to do because uh, you're talking about uh, 
uh, 500 odd engineers having to just completely change the way uh, uh, they've been working with uh, VMs and uh, uh, shared environments and the problems of getting things to prod, uh, you know, fast. And uh, to be able to act, uh, uh, have uh, mutually exclusive environments for everybody was going to be a huge uh, problem. So Swarm uh, uh, did help us, but it also caused its fair share of problems right up in the beginning. Swarm was not that mature, uh, maybe uh, a couple of years ago when we started off. So some of those problems uh, for the for the network uh, layers on Swarm uh, did come uh, come back and haunt us. And I, I think uh, some of the things that we did to ensure that you know it was to not have uh, one Swarm with uh, 50 or 60 nodes. Uh, and uh, as against you know, and, and we, we ended up having six swarms with 10 or 15 uh, nodes each. So in that way, swarm was able to cater to all the load, and this was something that we did very recently, and uh, to a lot of success. So scaling and access to those environments also was was another uh, bit. So uh, I'll, I'll quickly show you accessing uh, a particular cluster. So this is a small tool that we wrote. Suppose I, I am the API gateway developer. I quickly uh, uh, no, I, I want to quickly SSH into the API uh, gateway uh, application, and I want to see what the application logs are. So for this, uh, we created a small and uh, a small web shell tool, which basically is uh, an SSH interpreter uh, interrupter, and it will actually uh, you know quickly uh, show you the demo for it. So every cluster comes with with uh, an SSH command and a password for uh, each of the services. So I'm just going to quickly copy the SSH command for API gateway. Can you see this? Is it visible or should I? Right? Much better. So I'm just going to SSH into this particular service. And I'm inside the container. So this is not a normal SSH into a container. It's uh, an SSH service which uh, intercepts your uh, SSH command and then just do does a Docker exec into the container. So that's a small, another small tool. So if you see, this is a, a Node.js application which is running. And uh, you can actually uh, take a look at the logs or whatever you want. So this way, every single container that gets created, uh, you can also SSH into it. Modify the container, restart, because it's all yours. Obviously, you wouldn't go and restart uh, uh, containers uh, which are in you know, a shared environment. But if, it, if, you are, if you are testing something, if you are even developing something, you can quickly create a cluster with your service and just you know, SSH into it, make a few modifications, see how it pans out, restart your service, all those things. So this way, access also was uh, you know, uh, solved. And one of the other problems was the onboarding, considering the fact that there was no standard across the whole stack. We had, like, like Arun was saying, we had like Node.js, we had Golang services, Java services, Python services, uh, quite a few. And we had to standard, standardize all these services in such a way that you know, our Docker containers understood a certain format. You, know, you knew where your logs were, you knew where your uh, service startups were, all those kind of things were needed. So that was another cha challenge, but then nowadays uh, it, it's, uh, there is a standard format in which people have to you know, uh, provide us with information and we quickly uh, onboard it. So it's, it's, it's going to be a self-service uh, portal for that also. Another problem we faced was the fact that there, because there were so many uh, clusters available, so many environments that anybody could create, there was a lot of abuse of the, the, the capacity that we did. people were creating clusters left, right, center, and we, we were like, uh, easily running uh, short of uh, space on our uh, cloud provider. So obviously limitations based on the team for, or, or on the cluster service itself, limitations in the number of services that you could add into your cluster, questions on to why you could not have uh, you know, uh, done it with a smaller set of services. So those kind of things uh, and, and uh, limitations put in on the web UI itself uh, you know, solved uh, a lot of those problems. And uh, in the end, uh, network uh, challenges uh, did uh, force uh, reliability and robustness problems. But then once we've solved the network, it kind of uh, solved the reliability. And as of now, I think we've got uh, 
around uh, 2000 plus uh, uh, 2000 plus services uh, running on uh, 2500 cores and uh, like 30 TB of data that is going flowing across this whole stack and the whole uh, you know, anything that needs to go to production has to come through the stack right now. So that's uh, so what was the impact? Uh, no, how did this actually improve? Did it improve the productivity? The parallel de development uh, started becoming possible now because uh, people were able to create their own environments. The, each team was able to create their own sub environments, and you know all your features. And a single team could create multiple sub environments for their services uh, on different branches, different features of the same service. All of these things are possible. Uh, 32K uh, automated tests uh, were being run in parallel, uh, and this helped a lot on the production, uh, you know, issues. So uh, the average production deployments also uh, increased because of the fact that before uh, deploying code to production was a big headache. And people, uh, you know, uh, really didn't like it. developers now could focus on what they do best. They could just develop. While, you know, uh, your test environments are stable enough, your production deployments just flow through. So they have to absolutely not bother about any of these kind of things. So as soon as we've onboarded onto our uh, framework, there was absolutely nothing else that the developer needed to uh, you know, care about. So uh, overall, this would actually uh, give a lot more focus on the development task and there's no wait period wherein you know you have to wait for somebody to release a test fra uh, test infra so that your team can go and access it all those kind of problems just you know vanished so uh, going forward we also are uh, planning to put this uh, in the middle of our ci cd architecture and this is in the works right now and uh, yeah, this is a, a small diagram of how uh, uh, we've got uh, multiple flows which create, uh, you know, if you see right at the bottom, there is a commit review flow, very similar to something that uh, uh, Naresh was talking about earlier on, on the PR, feedback on the PR, and you know, this will actually give you integration candidates, which are the ICs, and uh, then it goes through the integration flow where, uh, you know, your QA environments are being churned out with all these uh, tests. That will become your delivery candidates. Your delivery candidates go to your bleeding edge environments like the integration environment. The delivery flow happens there, which is a 24 hour uh, uh, automation test that keeps going on. Once that is done, then it becomes your RC, your release candidate. And that release candidate goes through a, a deployment flow, through approvals, sign offs, and uh, all the reporting mechanism and into prod. So this is something that uh, we are uh, continuing to uh, work on. So uh, these are the other things that are also uh, coming. Uh, obviously, uh, like I said, uh, you did not see Kubernetes uh, until now. So uh, and, uh, network problems are a, are a thing uh, in, in, in Docker Swarm as of now. There have been solutions. There have been fixes, quite a few of them. We've tried multiple versions. But you know, uh, I, what we think is to uh, moving to Kubernetes is one of the better options rather than you know, waiting for a fix from the Docker Swarm side. So uh, obviously, simple uh, IP routing is also another way, rather than using Docker Swarm's uh, embedded DNS technique that they use. It's a very closed uh, uh, you know, uh, area wherein we really don't know how uh, they do this kind of technique also. So uh, instead of investing too much uh, time on Docker Swarm, our thing is to be able to switch completely to cluster IP models uh, on uh, Kubernetes and uh, not have fixed machine for services, you know, with uh, our, uh, you know, PVCs in uh, Kubernetes and we, volume claims are, are, you know, are all uh, standard features in Kubernetes nowadays. So you don't really need to uh, go into the fixed model that we use in Docker Swarm. A much uh, stable sandbox because of the fact that uh, you're not going to deal with DNS level uh, or service. E even in Kubernetes, we uh, one of the things that we are going to do is not use the service uh, workload at all and just use uh, uh, the controllers and uh, you know, cluster uh, IPs for our direct access. And core DNS is something which uh, we are planning to use also for this. So, uh, and uh, 
right now there is a slight difference between fixed environments and your uh, QA environments, but that is also going to uh, become a standard flow. Everything is uh, uh, an environment and which is a non-standard environment. So, uh, just to you know uh, wrap it up completely, uh, investing uh, I think three, three and a half years uh, um, in uh, you know making our test infra uh, robust, making it self-service really boosted our engineering productivity and also improved the quality. So I think you should do the same. Now these are a few uh, uh, quick tools that uh, we've done. Uh, some of them are up there on the, on the links. You can quickly check them out. They're all open sourced. Uh, some of the parts of our project are open source. So you can take a look at them. Some of them are orchestrators. Uh, the HAP reload is just uh, an auto reload of the HA proxy. So like the last step in my uh, environment creation was the auto reload of the HA proxy. So that's another tool. Right, I think we have time for questions. Um, yes, hi. I have a question on when your test environment falls back for some services on the stable environments. Uh, don't you have uh, cases where uh, your test environment actually is going to create data or, I mean, make the stable environment not stable, actually? I mean, the, your, in your stable environment, you're going to start seeing, uh, you know, logs requests that comes from outside the stable environment from, I don't know, I mean, something not very clear, probably. Right, right. Doesn't I, I think I've understood it creates the confusion, no? I, I, I understood your problem. It's something that is already there right now and uh, as of now most of the data that is being created is uh, forward looking and does not really affect the stable flow so that is one reason that has saved us in, in a way but yes this is a, is a problem we've not completely uh, tackled data as such even right now we uh, we use the uh, standard databases across all environments uh, because what we what we think is if you look at it every uh, config change on the database should be backward compatible. You cannot have, uh, you know, completely breaking changes unless you're switching across. But, uh, so in that sense, uh, you know, suppose that there, there is a change of a column type itself in, in, uh, in a database. We usually ask these uh, developers to go back, you know, create a new column, migrate the data, keep the old one back. So those kind of methodologies are used in, uh, so that, you know, we ensure backward compatibility. So in this way, uh, we have solved a few of these problems, but yes, there are quite a few other problems also which uh, arise because of erroneous data. I so just, uh, we've uh, also pushed it to add on to that, right? Uh, you know, I think uh, uh, the way we have structured is this: uh, uh, if if data is becoming an important stuff, it can also uh, be brought into the cluster. Right now, you know, when we started off, our schemas had. Uh, gone so far that uh, there was no single person who actually understood the database in the entirety. But few teams have, uh, you know, gone ahead and created database services as such, so that that could be uh, brought into your localized cluster. So whatever you are impacting is uh, is uh, is on the local databases. Hi. Um, first of all, that's a great presentation. Thank you. Uh, the question here is, so once you bring up the infrastructure, right, for someone to test it, is that same infrastructure used to run your suite of automation test cases, or do you have a different infrastructure for that? So, uh, it, it can be the same also. See, as a team, I can decide this sub-environment of mine uh -huh. is for my testing. Sure. And another sub-environment of mine is for my end-to-end -end automation suite. Okay. Right, so I have my Jenkins configured to talk to a particular environment uh -huh. as a config. So they have configurations on the on the Jenkins side also. You send in a parameter, give the QA environment's name, and they point it to a different uh, environment. So that uh, in that way, you can have separate uh, environments for each of your activities. So and you drive that through the same workflows. Exactly, it's yeah. the same thing. It's in the end, it's another environment. So the other possibility also is uh, so all of these are APIfied also. So. Uh, technically, uh, you know, what you could do is before you run the test, you could actually spin up an environment, run the test and uh, destroy the environment. So, uh, that's also uh, the possibility and if you are not using uh, it from a pure CI world, mm -hmm. 
um, uh, you could do that. Even on CI, you could do that. It's just that we uh, sometimes you may want to just save time in yeah. just bringing up the infrastructure and you know just redoing stuff. So, so uh, uh, that's how uh, uh, people, uh, few teams, um, you know, tend to use. Uh, so, so we have this, uh, uh, this concept uh, of uh, persistent clusters also, uh, which which don't uh, have a TTL. So these are usually used for automation suites and forever running tests. So. That's one way you know, people uh, set up those environments and uh, continue to run their tests. While the, all the others are just dev uh, environments or QA manual test environments. Yeah, I mean, again, thanks you, uh, thank you for the presentation. It's very nice. I'm more interested in running, I mean, understanding how do you test this infrastructure, whether it works or not. How frequently do you upgrade it? I mean, just one example. Let's say the Jenkins code, you have to keep updating it. They keep releasing stuff, right? Jenkins yeah. Corsair, for instance, right, you right. have to keep updating it for the vulnerability and all that stuff. Right. And every time you update, it's a new change. So how do you make sure your infrastructure as a whole is working? So as of now, we've done upgrades with respect to Docker, quite a bit of upgrades, and uh, we uh, consistently use uh, Ansible for our, uh, you know, upgrades across. I, I think we've got around uh, 200 odd uh, uh, machines running the whole stack in total. And uh, upgrading Docker across the whole stack is, is a big uh, job. And even swarm level uh, upgrades with respect to, you know, uh, uh, one of the, one of another solution that we had tried earlier for the swarm network issue was to, you know, just recreate the whole swarm again. You know, overnight at three or four in the, uh, uh, in the morning, uh, there used to be an automated cron which will go and sweep uh, the whole uh, swarm and uh, recreate all the services, all the environments, and you know, uh, get a fresh uh, network layer, reboot the underlying machines, which was one of the major uh, problems because there was a lot of percolated persistent data from long, which was causing network. And do you have any automated tests in a way like to understand even this particular uh, framework of yours is working and not giving false positives? Right, right. So uh, Ansible is the way in which we are actually uh, running these tests in to ensure that these uh, swarms have been up and ready and uh, the, the services are ready and in the state that they were before. So uh, it's, it's just a Jenkins job right now which runs uh, an Ansible suite uh, uh, on a regular basis. Yeah. And on the other side, you showed the form where we actually have to fill in to get the services. Yeah. So do you have, like, uh, if we would like to leverage this for, say, CI, Right, I mean, we don't have the form filling stuff over there. Do you templatize this standard configuration somewhere, or how do, how does like that that work? So uh, uh, overall, if you look at it, we've got like four or five types uh, based on the uh, build types. So we've got uh, Gradle, Maven, and uh, uh, some of them are just shell builds and stuff like that. So we've got a standard format and uh, uh, a performer of questions, which developers will just fill in while they're onboarding their services and uh, it's just a matter of entering this into yeah, just, just to add, right, I think uh, uh, we encourage uh, people to onboard. So when you create a code repo, so the, the way we are, where we are looking at this is uh, uh, anyone who wants to uh, create a new microservice or uh, in the company, uh, he just comes to this platform and tells the name and uh, the, uh, the repo, right from the repo onboarding to uh, uh, the dockins uh, onboarding into CI and uh, getting uh, production provisioning, everything should, uh, you know, happen in a quite seamless way. So that's the uh, that's the forward-looking uh, direction with which uh, we are trying to work towards. Right. Anything else? Last so question. Yeah. Last. Question. Yeah. Uh, so how do you get the sample data set? I think that's the same question that we Seed data. So, yeah. Uh, on these small databases. So, so, sir, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, so when we started this, right, you know, so there, there are a couple of uh, techniques that we use. Um, uh, uh, we started off building the stage and, uh, you know, the initial environment by actually uh, taking the production data, the entire bunch of production data, pruning them to make sure that uh, uh, all the sensitive information and, um, you know, uh, information that, you know, uh, one should not probably be seeing. So it runs through a number of pruning steps and, you know, that uh, comes as a seed data. So there are actually teams uh, uh, where, uh, let's say, new type of 
category of products and many other things gets uh, released on production, but they may not necessarily be on uh, stage, right? So those t those kind of team those teams actually once in a while they uh, you know bring the data in an automated fashion from uh, the production into the stage uh, using the pruning uh, techniques. Uh, we are also looking forward to you know one, uh, on the integration environment when things starts going. So you start actually seeding some of the data from this side also before it goes to production. So it works both ways. So hence uh, you start getting the uh, the test data baked in uh, uh, correctly for your test. Right. Thank you. Thanks a lot. <laughs>